When a strong man guards his possessions, they're safe, or so he thinks, until a stronger man comes in and takes away the armor in which he trusted and divides the spoil. The Pharaoh of Egypt believed that he was a god upon the earth. This was the doctrine taught to their people. While there were many different gods and goddesses, they made the idols of them large and deep, all most of whom were humanoid with animal heads, although there were a few Egyptian gods that had animal bodies and human heads. This perverse mixture of that which is a creature and that which was made in the image of God. And they worshiped the creature instead of the creator, and they invested divine divinity and power in their pharaoh. Their pharaoh was God and man upon the earth, and after his death they would preserve his body for the day of his future resurrection, when he would come back from the stars and reign again. In a weird way, it sounds almost biblical, but of course it should, because based on word of mouth, the legends handed down by the descendants of Adam and Eve, little bits and pieces of things changed and obscured were there. But ultimately, as anything perverted and created by men, it was infused with sin and self-centeredness. The self-servingness of a divine pharaoh to be worshipped on earth and in the afterlife. A guy who literally owned everybody in his land, that literally owned all the land in all of the kingdom. The guy was the most maniacal despot of history by that standard. He controlled he controlled everything and every aspect of everything. And he owned the Hebrew slaves outright. It's a very different system than a lot of other nations at the time and later. Slaves were not privately owned. The Hebrews had been subjugated by the government for government purposes. You didn't go to the marketplace and buy a Hebrew. Rather, the government owned the Hebrews and they might let you borrow them once in a while. But for the most part, they did government projects. You see, Pharaoh was the strong man. He trusted in his armor and his chariots and his horses. In every respect, the most powerful nation the earth had yet seen and an empire thereof from sub-Saharan Africa through the Holy Land to Southern Europe the Egyptians at various times controlled this vast economic and human empire where they ran people's lives and controlled their possessions. The Hebrews being God's people, but being slaves of this greatest nation on earth, God comes into the world in power, in force, to remove them from their slavery, to shatter the bonds and bring them out of Egypt. He is the stronger man that will invade and plunder. He will take away those things which Pharaoh trusts in, washing those chariots to the bottom of the bottom of the Red Sea, destroying untold numbers of soldiers and common people. God will cripple the empire of Egypt. Not beyond repair, because it will bounce back in the future, but it takes at least a few centuries to begin to recover from what God Almighty does. And that's really the point of the whole system of plagues and confrontation. The real point of the whole, that whole part of the Exodus is God entering into Egypt as an evangelist. God comes into Egypt to preach the law and the gospel. God enters Egypt in force and takes it down as a testimony of his own existence, his power, his truthfulness. God reveals the impotence of the Pharaoh and that he is not a God. He throws the Egyptians into some religious doubt and turmoil that will last for a few centuries. For a while, they will even worship only one God, though they won't call him by the right name. They, won't, they will be so befuddled with how to make sense of how their whole world turned upside down with a weird, singular God of a desert slave people overthrew the power of their empire and walked out. But God does this methodically, and he does it over a period of time. They had many gods and goddesses, but they had chief among them seven or ten that you could count. The various plagues that God visits upon them touch upon the animal images of those gods and goddesses. I need a cup of water like I used to do that when I got lost I could pretend that I was that I was thirsty. 
Bit by bit, God, in putting the plagues upon Egypt, demonstrates the impotence of their false gods and goddesses. He breaks and undermines the power of them. This is why he keeps coming back and hardening Pharaoh's heart. Unlike the movie version, in the scripture, it is God that every time the Pharaoh tries to give up, God comes back and eggs him on further. And it almost seems cruel. But God isn't done with Pharaoh and his people until he has played out the whole drama of undermining, defeating, and destroying all the power of their gods. We sometimes forget this in the subtext. The magicians that work for the Pharaoh go about performing their own miracles in case we missed that. Early on, when God turns the water to blood, they are able to turn the water to blood. The magicians make snakes out of staffs. They do various magic tricks using the power of the devil to try to counteract the work of God. But as the plagues progress, they are increasingly powerless. They cannot replicate the power of the plague, nor can they concoct any kind of cure or immunity against it. As the Israelites will go uncovered by gnats and unplagued by flies, the magicians of the Egyptians can neither remove the flies from Egypt nor make the flies gather on the Israelites. The devil cannot create. He can only pervert, abuse, and destroy. He can manipulate the things that are, but he cannot create out of nothing. He cannot summon a miracle that will deliver the Egyptians so that they will be more inspired to worship their idols. It can't pan out. And so in this conflict, God versus Pharaoh, God versus Satan, God versus the idols of the world, God is inevitably going to be victorious. But he's going to do it bit by bit as a testimony and a preaching. People will be dead by the time this is over in large numbers because of the plagues and the misery and the suffering and finally the death of the firstborn. But God will be bearing witness also of the gospel by proclaiming that he is the only God. In him is the power of life and death. Not in Pharaoh, not in your idols, not anywhere else. Only in the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, the one the Israelites worship and that is known to them, the one forgotten and obscured by the false religions of the world. He proclaims it himself by delivering his people. From the greatest nation the world had yet seen, therefore God proclaims to them and to all the world that it is he that has taken action. Certainly the slaves don't do it themselves. The slaves could not summon such miracles, and they certainly couldn't do it by their own blood, sweat, and tears. They are people that are gifted their freedom, and they're gifted it by an almighty God that can bring low all the nations of the earth. But he does something else too. There's an interesting hidden sort of testimonial of the gospel. That old joke about playing a country song backwards so you get, you get back all the things that you lost. If we work the plagues in reverse, we find that the plague of the death of the firstborn, the thing that points to what God is going to do. Oh yes, it's what he does to the Egyptians and it's what Herod will do to the people of Bethlehem. But God sends his firstborn son into the world to die for our sins, not to kill or destroy, but to die in our stead. And working backwards from that, he is the God that relieves all of our plagues of the gnats, of the flies, of the rats, of the, the suffering and misery of the sores and the disease. All the way back to the beginning, he is the God who turns the water into blood and the blood into water, the water from the rock that feeds his thirsty people, the font bubbling over in holy baptism, the blood of Jesus Christ given to his people to consume, the life-giving waters of Egypt being made blood, the life-giving blood of Jesus Christ that washes away our sin. The gospel is in the subtext of all of the plagues. The things that God is visiting upon them are the things that their sin causes them to deserve. Those are the things they have earned by every bit of merit and worthiness in them. Flies and gnats and suffering and death. But God behind that is promising what he will give them. The thing they don't deserve. The spoils that he's going to distribute freely after he takes away the armor of the strong man. 
When he smashes the power of Pharaoh, the slaves go free. When he smashes the power of Satan, the world is liberated. When he smashes what's left of the sinful cosmos, it will be made anew and perfect and fresh and clean and eternal and filled with nothing but eternal life and love and purity. The God who destroys that which is wicked repairs that which is faithful, rebuilds, restores, and remakes those who believe. He purifies and cleanses. He fixes the water. He chases away the gnats, destroys the flies. He fixes the flesh even unto resurrection from death itself. All of this hidden in the working of the text of that God that continues to work in us and through us. To continue to work in his church here where he continually cleanses us from our walking death of sin, forgiving us and absolving us, separating us out from the world and its idols. And as this world continues to crumble by the ongoing divine invasion of Christ's church in the world, and most assuredly completely at his coming in glory, he is still here cleansing us by the water, by the blood, freeing us from the pains and tortures of the sores and the gnats and the flies of the world and turning death into life, new life, and eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen.